So we're gonna we're gonna continue. Hopefully, our stragglers will will return. Um, uh, sorry for the short break, but we're trying to make sure you get a full lunch out of out of today as well. Have an opportunity to go upstairs and look at, at the exhibit. Um, our second panel at today's symposium is devoted to the theme of archaeology. Uh, now, I know a lot of you may be thinking, didn't we just hear from two archaeologists at the uh, previous panel devoted to African Americans? Uh, the answer is yes, of course, but uh, for many of the topics that we're exploring today, archaeology often provides the best evidence, filling in many holes uh, that exist in the written record. And a case in point is the town of Nottingham. Like Bladensburg, Nottingham played a key role in the Chesapeake Theater of the War of 1812. And like Bladensburg, much of its historical record is missing or unclear. To remedy this lack of information, the Maryland National Capital Parks and Planning Commission embarked on a program to document archaeological resources in Prince George's County that are relevant to our understanding of events during the war. To tell us about this project and its findings, uh, I'm pleased to introduce two people. Uh, first, Don Krebling, who since 1988 has served as the manager of the archaeology program for Parks and Planning. In this capacity, he oversees all the archaeological resources in the county's parks and historic sites. Today, he returns to his alma mater, as both his undergraduate and graduate degrees are from the University of Maryland. And Don will be sharing the podium with Emily Swain, who has served as the field director for the Nottingham Archaeology Project. Emily is an archaeologist on the staff of the Maryland National Capital Parks and Planning Commission. She is a graduate of Maryhurst University and completed her MAA degree here at the University of Maryland as well. So, I'm Emily. Thank you. Doug. Uh, good oh. morning. Uh, and as you'll see in a second, I have the easiest job today. Uh, because Prince George's County and the Chesapeake region had such a significant role in the War of 1812, there has been a lot of excitement in Maryland's archaeological community about expanding our knowledge of the war through grant opportunities that commemorate the war's bicentennial. The War of 1812 changed the economic and cultural dynamic of the Chesapeake region. Economic sanctions crippled the economy and treaties by the British military to the enslaved population offered opportunities for freedom and disrupted the plantation system. And the invasion of Charles and Prince George's counties and the burning of Washington changed Marylanders' visions and attitudes about themselves and their country. The Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission is the steward of over 27,000 acres of parkland in Prince George's County. Several of these properties experienced direct involvement in the events of the war in the summer of 1814. The most well-known of these events to the public is the Battle of Bladensburg, some of which occurred on our parkland, and the capture of William Beams in Upper Marlboro, which is associated with John Hodges of Darnell's Chance, one of our parks, and recently the effort to rediscover the remains of Commodore Joshua Barney's fleet of row barges in the Upper Patuxent River at Patuxent River Park. Most of these areas of parkland have been dramatically altered by urban development, or in the case of Barney's flotilla, the shifting sands and silt of the river. Nottingham, a small rural town located along the Patuxent River in southern Prince George's County, offers a unique opportunity to explore not only the War of 1812 site, but an early 18th century through 20th century town and adjacent farmland in a relatively undisturbed condition. From 2011 through 2013, the archaeology program of the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission conducted phase one and phase two archaeological investigations at Nottingham. A great deal of this research was funded by a Star Spangled 200 grant, which was mentioned earlier. Dr. Michael Lucas was the principal investigator of the project, and Emily Swain served as the field director. Therefore, it is only fitting that she give the presentation of the results. As the archaeology program manager, I'm once again proud that another graduate of the University of Maryland MAA program has made the transition from student to professional via their work through our program. Please welcome Emily Swain. So I'm going to be talking about Nottingham, and like Don said, Nottingham is not near here. 
Um, so the University of Maryland is is up here, and Nottingham is down here, the Red Star. So Nottingham was founded in 1706 as a port town. There was probably some buildings there already. So it is known for its deep harbor. So in 1706, port town founded. It was probably a lot like we found at Mount Calvert, where there weren't very many people living there. It's a lot of storehouses. Um, maybe a few residences, but most people were living outside, and so they would bring their tobacco to Nottingham to load onto ships to take back to England, and also to come and get goods that they needed, such as um, nails, horse hardware for their um, like bridles, saddles and such, um, any food stock that they couldn't get in the States. Um, and so then in 1747, it was made official, where uh, Nottingham, as well as I believe Bladensburg, you had to bring, they were made official tobacco inspection stations. So you were required then, by law, that if you were bringing, if you were going to sell any of your tobacco, you had to bring it to one of these inspection stations to be um, packaged and sent off on ships. So, like I also said, Nottingham was known for Steve Harbor, and so the War of 1812. Yeah, try, try to get. Okay, so during the, the War of 1812, Nottingham played a pretty pretty big role. Um, this guy, some of you may be wearing buttons with his face on it. This is Commodore Joshua Barney. And Barney used Nottingham's um, as a staging area for his harassment of the British. So he formed the Chesapeake Flotilla as a way of being a gnat in the face of the British. He annoyed every single British officer on the flotilla, or on their, their flotilla. Um, and Nottingham's the perfect place because you had a deep harbor, so you could bring in these ocean going ships to help supply his troops. And um, this is a, just a drawing of one of his barges. So Barney was using Nottingham, and the British knew they, that he was using Nottingham. So when the British landed in Benedict, in, they landed down here in Benedict on August 19th, during the middle of the night. So they land there, they spend the day there, um, and into the next day, and then they start heading north to march toward, toward Washington. And this was a two-pronged attack. So you've got these little British, or these little American ships, bigger British ships, and so the, the American ships were annoying the British. So um, Admiral Coburn said, all right, I'm gonna follow Barney, we're gonna destroy him, capture as many ships as we can, Ross, you're going to take the land troops and you're going to march toward Washington. So um, they marched for two days before hitting Nottingham. But the night before, they stopped at Patuxent City, which was only six miles. Uh, these men had been on the ships for quite a while, so they were not used to the Chesapeake summer wearing their wool uniforms and carrying all this gear. So they straggled into Patuxent City and then got rained on. And this will play a little part in, in what I'm going to talk about later. Um, so then they managed to march to Nottingham, and after Nottingham, the, the land and the sea troops just kind of split. The uh, Coburn and his crew continued north to, on the river, to follow Barney. They ended up seeing the ship, uh, the flotilla being scuttled, um, and then he backtracked to Mount Calvert, unloaded his troops to meet the land troops at Upper Marlboro. So, to go to Nottingham. Nottingham, um, and actually, the entire march to Washington is pretty well documented. We have an engineer who was traveling with the British troops, and he mapped every single encampment. So this was one of our, our really good sources of information to find out where the British were. And as you can see in this map, he's got the town, and there's several buildings in the town, and the encampment was outside the town. So they were blocking the two main roads. This is uh, currently Nottingham Road, and this was Tanyard. We think Tanyard was the original road leading in. The, the major road. And so the British would have camped here and then left by Nottingham Road up to what's currently Fenno. So we have a map, which is great. We also have documentary um, evidence. And this guy, he was only 18 at the time, but he was very loquacious in his writing. Um, it's actually very entertaining to read his work. Um, he wrote this account after the war when he was a chaplain for the British Army. And so he provides an account of everything that happened uh, as they're marching. He, he notes that the British met these two American militiamen in the woods. And Can you use the microphone, please? He met two militiamen in the woods, and the, the militiamen were just pretending to be out squirrel hunting, but obviously with bayonets on their muskets, they, they, were, they were up to something else. 
Um, and he also remarks that the British did meet up with a small American contingent as they were fleeing Nottingham. They were um, under the command of Secretary of State Monroe, who had taken it upon himself to spy on the British and report back. Um, so we have really great accounts. And so, um, all of you, that's our park property. So we had quite a few acres to survey. We surveyed 13.8 acres, which included this property, this here, as well as the, the town site down there. And there's uh, Mike Lucas metal typing. So that was our, our main way of finding the encampment. Because if you think about, you're in an agricultural field, you've got these men who are, who are carrying all their gear with them, they're not gonna be leaving anything behind that it's gonna be worth shovel testing for. And shovel tests, you're looking at these tiny little holes, you don't find much that way. It's just kind of putting it on the grid and hoping you find something. But with metal detecting, because this was an agricultural field, um, and all the plow, the plow does is it just turns things up. So it's like, like I tell the kids when we have them come out, it's like a washing machine. So you throw all your clothes in, and after the cycle's done, your clothes aren't in the same order. So all this stuff is mixed up over the years, and because these, these men were wearing a lot of metal, they are obviously losing a lot of metal too. So they're losing things um, like, and this is showing up what we found, so losing things like musket balls. Um, they're losing musket balls, they're losing uh, possibly a tip to the bayonet, um, these are worms or patch pullers, and these were used to clean out the barrel of the gun, and also to um, pull out any wad that got stuck in there. Um, they also had a, this is the lead flint wrap, which is just holds the flint in place. Um, so let's go back to this map. So what we did is we, we um, initial, our initial testing, we have a, there's a barn right about here. And so we decided we'd go from the barn and try and cross the encampment line. And once we found out where that was, we would turn and we would go with the encampment. So these little outliers here, those are the result of us doing our initial testing. Um, and then we expanded into a 200 by 400 foot area. And we, we were very systematic about this. Most people think metal detector is, they'll, they'll find what they can and just pocket it. But with us, we actually flagged everything, um, dug it to see what it was, and then mapped everything in. So what we found is um, surprisingly a lot of nails. So I decided not to show you that because it'll blow everything else out. So two thirds of what we found were nails, which is interesting. Um, but what we also found are, are abuse categories. And arms, which include musket balls, um, bayonets, those types of things. Um, activities, it's related to um, production of musket balls or just um, agricultural activity as well. It's an active agricultural field. So you're gonna find things related to that. Um, clothing, buttons, buckles, um, personal items, I'll, I'll get to those, those are interesting. Um, kitchen, we did find some random pieces of ceramic and glass that were just kind of sitting on the surface, so we picked them up. And the unclassified things are mostly modern stuff that's not related to the, the British. So the things we did find, like I already showed you, we've got a bayonet, which was an interesting find. You wouldn't think that um, they would want to lose a bayonet. Those were it was a pretty necessary if you're going to be fighting close quarters. Um, we, and we also found 62 musket balls. And if you notice in the, in, in the shot, they're all cut. And most of them are only cut once. And a musket ball, if it's been fired, it's not going to be perfectly round. These, we found 62 of them, all of them are round. 60 of them have cut marks. So if you go back to what I was saying about the night before they got here, it rained on them. So these guys were carrying pouches that had musket balls in them. The pouches are getting wet, the cartridges are getting wet. So the cartridge was just a paper cartridge, musket ball, gunpowder. They would load that in to their guns to shoot it off. Well, if you got wet gunpowder, it's not gonna explode. So we think when they got to Nottingham, they remembered, oh yeah, it kind of rained the night before, maybe we should go through our packs. If anything's wet, just discard it. So we think that the fact that none of these are fired and that they've got cut marks, which would have helped with the exploding factor once it hits a, a bone or even a, a dense piece of flesh, it's gonna expand more with cut mark. Um, we think these were all on fire and just discarded. And we also think they may have been making musket balls there or at least had material with them. We found this large chunk of lead as well as two others that may be indicative of manufacturing. And um, they may have been making them here um, 
not while they were the main contingent was camping, but they left a rear guard and they came back to Nottingham. So they, there was a rear guard there for about a week. So this may be related to their encampment. We also found buckles and buttons. Um, and some of them were actually really interesting. This one up here on the top left, that is a shoulder strap buckle. So that would have been attached to the cartridge case as a way to adjust it. Um, this one is a stock buckle. So uh, you get the term leatherneck from this. A stock is just this big piece of leather that holds your head up and also protects against sabers. So you've got guys coming at you with swords. This, this protects your neck from getting slashed. Um, we also had a lot of, uh, we had 10 buckles, 10 buttons. Um, this button is uh, actually labeled, which is one of a very unique button that we found. It's from the 75th Regiment of the British Army. The 75th Regiment was not known to actually be in America. Um, it was stationed in the Mediterranean at the time. But what we think happened is because the British were fighting not only us, but also Napoleon, they're losing troops left and right. So you've got a guy who's injured and he gets better. So what do you do? You send him back to his unit? Well, his unit might not be, there might not be enough men in his unit to have a full unit again. So you just send him off to the next thing. Oh, he's, he's well, there's a boat leaving for America. Put him on the boat. So he's there, he's bringing his uniform with him. Explains a little bit of why we're getting something odd. We also found these two coins, and this one you can kind of see the head. Um, but these coins are, are very worn, and we think they were used for cutting tobacco. So these are the, the two personal items, uh, two of the three personal items we found. So they're, they've got scratch marks on them. Okay, and so the, the main portion of what we were doing wasn't just the metal detecting, we also did shovel tests. And like I said, there are these round holes. We dig them at, at designated intervals, in this case 25 feet apart, and this is just a map of, of all of them. So you see we covered a good area. And from this, we use artifact densities as well as what we found to determine where to dig in the future. Um, two of our really great sources of where to dig, because we were focusing on the town as well as the encampment, we have two very good maps. We've got the 1861 Martinet map, and it shows you the main town is clustered here. Uh, the property we own are, are these two highlighted ones. And then we also have an 1878 map that, again, shows the main core of the town. So there are several sites, several houses and stores that are on the properties we own. So in addition to using maps and the, the information from our shovel test, we did geophysical testing. And geophysical testing, we used two different versions. You may have heard of GPR, which is ground penetrating radar. Um, that is the bottom one here. It looks like Tim is pushing a lawnmower across the ground. But what this does is it actually sends a signal into the ground and the way it bounces back can tell you what's down there. So um, if you're hitting a wall, it might bounce back at a different frequency than if you're hitting, say, um, a buried stream bed. We also used this thing, which is kind of hard to see, but it's called a magnetometer, and it produces this map. And the magnetometer is it's a big metal detector, is how Wikipedia says it simply. And so it, it looks for concentrations of metal. Um, so you're going to find um, slag, which is the byproduct of making metal nails and horseshoes and such, but also is useful for finding brick. And brick is kind of unique. When you fire brick, it usually has a lot of, the re reason it's red is because it has an iron concentration. So when you fire brick, it actually takes the magnetic properties of the kiln in which it's fired. So if the brick is facing north, that's going to be the north end of the brick. But once you take it out of the kiln, kiln it loses that magnetic um, direction. But it still retains its magnetic properties. So as, it, as you see here, there's a nice dark area. Um, that's a lot of brick. So we use Tim's house, or Tim's maps, to find different things. And go back here. You see there's a couple concentrations right there. He's got a couple here from the, the GPR of just areas that kind of pop in him. And so from that, we use, this is a stylized version of the map, and we think we found one of, one of the buildings that may have been here in 1814. This was owned by a Scottish merchant. Um, he actually lost two ships in, uh, to the British. Um, I think one of them actually ended up in the Caribbean, or in the Gulf at one point. 
but he filed a claim, and so we know that he was living on the property somewhere, so we think we found his house, and we think this is what represents it. So you don't normally find a pile of brick unless there's a building there, and the building was demolished. So we've got this conspicuous pile of brick, and then this area right here, we think is actually an intact living surface. So that's pretty cool, we actually didn't excavate it. Um, and not only does Tim find old stuff, he actually finds more recent features. So we've got a 20th century trash pit that was next to an old barn. And then again, we've got this um, 19th century living surface. And to get back to more of the town site, more of what we have on our historic maps, that's this portion of the property. And as you can see, there's a lot of linear features. Um, and we tested a good portion of that. So his magnetic, uh, magnetometer interpretation, or another thing that the magnetometer looks for is not just brick and nails and stuff, but it will also pick up some burning. Um, and I'm not exactly sure how that works, but it, it, in this case, you've got these features that he picked up that are probably burn features. And if you look at them, they do look a little rectangular. So we think they were buildings there. So you've got, that's um, one of the areas where we actually excavated. So we think building, but we actually found was this. It's a paling trench, which is essentially a boundary trench uh, for a, a fence post. We didn't actually find the fence post, but we did um, excavate down in here. There was a lot of oyster shell, um, a couple interesting artifacts that, yeah, here we go. Um, yeah, really pretty stuff. So, and, and these are, these ceramics are actually really good for dating. Um, we figured out, based on what we have, that it probably is War of 1812 era, somewhere between 1800 and 1830, based on the different patterns. There's the oyster shell we found, um, bone, this one's cut. Found some other little guys that are interesting. Um, so from there we're going to move to this, which may be another structure. And in this case, um, one of the things that he showed us was that uh, there was some plowing. So the plow, it's not consistently across here, but like I said, the plow mixed these things up. And it's actually really easy to dig through plow zone. So that's what we found with um, these two units. So we had a really easy time digging through there, and we came down on this, which we're not exactly sure what it is because we didn't dig enough around it to figure it out specifically, but um, it could be related to a wall, it could be a privy, it's, it's an interesting feature. Um, particularly because of these two objects. So the one on the left is not, these are, neither of these are related to the War of 1812, but they're very interesting. Um, <laughs> these are the actual artifacts, and these are just um, pictures I got from the internet to show them more clearly. So we've got a, an 1812, or, um, sorry, a Civil War militia button, sort of been worn by um, one of the troops. And we also have this one, which is really, really interesting. This is a Grand Army of the Republic Veterans Commemorative Button. Which, if you think about Prince George's County, most of these, most of the troops from Prince George's County would not have been in the Grand Army of the Republic, which was the Union Army. So we've got a Union Army button in a predominantly Confederate county, and this may have been found in a privy, so. Right. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> um, and then one of our, our biggest things that we actually focused a lot on, we've got five units around this one is this, this building, and if you look at it, it doesn't match the roads. So the roads would have been this way and this way. So it pops up really nicely, we found a lot of brick in it, and what is it? And the interesting thing is it doesn't appear on the, the formal historic maps, the 1861 Martinet or the 1878 Hopkins maps, but it does potentially appear on the 1814 engineer's map. So is it the same structure? We're not really sure. We didn't find any artifacts that will let us date to when it was constructed. But what was interesting um, is we did find a lot of slag. And like I said, slag is the result of metal manufacture, nails and horseshoes and such. And this popped up, um, these two right over here turned up the most, and they're on the interior of the structure. And the amount of slag we found, based on um, some of the research that Mike Lucas did, we think this may have been a blacksmith shop. 
there was mention of a blacksmith shop somewhere on the property. And it likely, if it was still standing when some of the historic maps were done, it probably wasn't noted because it was an auxiliary building. It wasn't a residence, it wasn't a major store. And for those historic maps, you had to pay to get your name put on them. So if it's just this, um, this blacksmith shop, it's why put it on there. It's not that important building. Um, and we also found evidence of a Methodist meeting house. And the Methodist meeting, um, uh, the Methodist group that's associated with it, they're currently um, still in the area. And they have actually held ceremonies down here. And we actually, we were, um, they were just holding them in the general area of here. But we kind of found out where the, we think the meeting house was for them. So next time they can come down to do any memorial activities, we can say it was probably here and not over in the other area. Um, and we also have these main things, which I haven't talked about yet. So these are these bigger clusters right along the road, right here. So um, if you look at the historic maps, there's a couple buildings right along the road, and they're mostly owned by Stamp. And if anybody has been to, was down at Nottingham in the um, mid-1900s, you probably remember seeing a store that was there. It would have been this one right here, spread in the 80s. It was known as the Downing Stamp Store. Um, and so Stamp was, he was pretty prominent. He had his store, he had a residence. Uh, there may have been another building associated with him, there's the post office. But we think we found some evidence of his house. There's a store there. Um, we found uh, cellar features. So these dark areas are where um, the geophysicist, <coughs> the geophysicist um, thinks that cellars were, this one in particular. But we actually found over here, we found a cellar, um, this intact wine bottle, which is amazing, we never find intact wine bottles. We found that uh, 3.2 feet below, and artifacts were continuing down over four feet. So it's obviously something very deep. Um, and we didn't dig that one because it was obviously a cellar feature, but um, he has these gray ones. He thinks they were surfaces. So surfaces related to a cellar, maybe, maybe not. But what we found, um, it's really hard to see, that's why I have the drawing on, up next to it. We think we found floorboards. So this was probably related to a cellar, likely not the original surface, but it's probably the cellar. Everything's been graded pretty much, so it's interesting things. Um, and above those, um, we found five coins. And they were all found in the same area, and it's likely a lost coin purse. These are George II and George I coins, um, half pennies, all found exactly together within a few, a few uh, inches really of each other. Just kind of amazing. We found three of them in a shovel test that was in the unit, and then two more in the actual unit itself. And we don't always find interesting things, too, just to put it in perspective. We also find buried roads, which are kind of interesting, they kind of tell you very path, very road, but they're not really what we were looking for, so something unique. And then outside the town we found a midden, and this was found during a shovel test survey, and so we've got some pretty artifacts from that. A midden's just a trash bin. Yeah, so it, it's just, they, they found some place to dump their trash, and we call it a midden. And that's all I have, so thank you. Our next presenter is Noel D. Broadbent. Professor Broadbent's professional career was spent as a research associate in the Department of Anthropology at the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History. His research has led to archaeological investigations on at least four continents, I, I believe, um, and has led to numerous awards. Since his retirement, Professor Broadbent has shifted focus to more local interests, and today he will be discussing his award-winning work on the site of Joshua Barney's position at the Battle of Bladensburg. Thank you, Roger. Uh, well, I want to, I have a very hoarse voice. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, Stay close to the microphone. All right. Is that good? Good. That's good. All right. Um, I want to first thank Mike and Doug for the invitation to speak here today. 
Um, Joshua Barney is without doubt the central figure in the narrative of the Battle of Lanesburg. His heroic stand, together with Marine Captain Samuel Miller, is legendary. Severely wounded and out of ammunition, he finally ordered his men to retreat and stay behind. His wounds were treated near the natural and near natural spring, which was then called Barney Spring, and he was paroled and allowed to return home. In spite of the new monument to Barney, uh, little attempt has been made to identify or mark exactly where he fought. In the following, I will attempt to identify his position, including the spring and the original Washington Turnpike, based on first-hand accounts, oral history, and references to historic buildings. In doing so, I've discovered how much local history is still preserved along Bladesburg Road in spite of the heavy development. The reason I got involved in this project was my desire to support local education. This was an entirely volunteer-based project intended to support local school kids through the Benjamin Harrison Society. And here we are, very patriotic, standing by the uh, Barney Monument, which is on the, link, the grounds of Lincoln Cemetery. It was built around 1972. Uh, as I said, it was a volunteer project. We worked for 19 Saturdays. There were lots of people. I drummed them up from all over the place. In addition, I want to thank uh, Ruth Tricoli, the Park Service, Dan Wagner, Jim Doolittle, uh, people from DDOT, and Aquanet and Ronald Anderson. Um, here you can see uh, the uh, Lincoln Cemetery, the Barney Monument is located on the DC line, quite far from actually where Barney was. The old Spring House Banner Jameson is here. The dueling ground is here, and U.S. Reservation 520, which is at the intersection of Eastern Avenue and Blazeburg Road, is right there. Uh, here's an aerial shot of this parcel of land, and believe it or not, this land belongs to the Park Service. It was part of Rock Creek Park. Originally, it covered a little area across the street. But this land, or that area, was ceded uh, to the district and is slated for development. Williams Hurt uh, Road see, um, is now 65 feet wide. There's a concrete medium. <coughs> this is uh, the Lincoln Cemetery. And also notice there's a small road here, which we'll see in later pictures. Uh, this is the road looking down toward Dooley Creek. The British came marching up this road, Lincoln Cemetery on the right. Um, Barney had two 18-pounders, which are naval guns, and the Marines who were with him had three 12-pounders. They were arranged in a battery, which means that all five guns were side by side together. And they were using great shot. You can imagine the force of five guns shooting down this road. The British Army was stopped in their tracks. Three times they tried to force their way up the road. And finally, when Barney was wounded, uh, they, um, the British moved their troops around and flanked him. He was out of ammunition. He said, all right. Uh, I'm staying, he ordered his men to retreat. When you turn around and look up the road, you're right on the boundary between D.C. and Maryland. This is the area of 520. And please note that this is the crest of the road, which I will get back to at the end of the lecture. Uh, this is the, by now, pretty well-known uh, map showing the British um, 
the bridge at Bladensburg, which the British crossed, the American lines, which fell back, and Barney's line, a third line of defense, which consists of his artillery and about 400 flotilla men and 114 Marines. This is actually a British drawing of the battle. Uh, it's a, a very small portion of this drawing, but it shows the battery of five guns, a Congreve rocket being fired at them, and here is the line of infantry off to uh, Barney's right. Now, looking at a number of sources, uh, we get uh, a picture of where he was. Using his own words, he states, I preceded the men, and when I arrived at the line which separates the district from Maryland, the battle began. I sent an officer back to hurry on my men. They came up in a trot, and we took up our position on the rising ground. Two 18 pounders were placed in the middle of the road, and three 12 pounders were placed on the right. Now, in a later source, and I'm particularly uh, going to talk about Lossing, um, uh, it stated that the ground where Commodore Barney stood was high on both sides of the road. On the left was a large brick barn and house belonging to Mr. Reeves. Uh, the Reeves property is referenced in another source. Once again, the two 18-pounders were in the highway a few yards from the Reeves barn. When Barney was shot, uh, wounded in the thigh, he was carried to a very, uh, to a, a natural spring, or a fountain, living fountain of water, which is known as Barney Spring. And then this is another reference to that spring. Now, here is the Reeves house, the Reeves residence, and the, the description in Lawson, and basically is, uh, saying what I have already quoted, that Barney had his uh, guns, his 18-pounders, in the turnpike. Here is a picture of the Reeves Mansion around 1919. Um, it was known in 1921 as Jimmy's Place, or the Las Vegas of Cotton City. <laughs> and it was owned by a rather nefarious character La Fontaine, Jimmy La Fontaine, and according to college City history, the mansion was on the Maryland side and the barn on the DC side, making convenient for La Fontaine to dart from one jurisdiction to the other during police raids. Uh, this house was actually burned by the Cottage City Fire Department in about 1950. Unfortunately, none of this is visible today. Not even the spring, there's nothing. Uh, we got really lucky, however, in that we found in this larger map from 1863, there is a nice layout of the Reeds property that we found in the corner of the map. It's about that big, it's sort of uh, blown up. Here is the Reeds mansion. There is the turnpike. Here are the Reeves barns. Um, Barney's position was, well, first of all, we know he was in the turnpike, uh, on or near the DC line, which runs about there. Eastern Avenue, of course, was not going to be built until much, much later. Uh, between two areas of high ground, well, we've got one area here and the other area over here, several yards from the Reeves farm. Well, it has to be this barn, this building, and that would put him right there. Near a spring, 200 yards southwest of the mansion, and that is actually shown here. That is probably the spring. Uh, those barns were built quite a bit later. They weren't there during the battle, but when uh, they were interviewing people in the 1860s about the battlefield site. Local people seemed to know pretty closely 
where the Barnet had been and used these barns as reference. Actually, the Betch barn is located, uh, which is uh, shown in this map from 1861, is located in exactly the same spot. There's that little side road, there's the turnpike. Uh, these barns are still there in this uh, map from 1888, and they're indicated as being brick stable and, or garages. And I could not believe my eyes when I found this map from about 1965. And here is the right Reeves property indicated. And there's sort of a sketch of another barn, or, or a, one of these two barns there. So that means that that building, or at least the foundation of the building, was there as late as the 60s. Although no one in the area seems to have any memory of there being a barn there. It was probably just a room. Um, we got help uh, from Jim Doolittle, USDA, who did EMI prospecting. This is a, uh, basically a way to measure disturbance in the soil. This is the area across the street from the area that we're going to investigate, which is here. And you can see there's a lot of disturbance. These red blobs show that. The reason is there was a gas station there, and those were where the gas tanks had been. In fact, when you dig in that soil, it still reeks of gas. Um, we, uh, in uh, Reservation 520, the Park Service land, we had very weak indications, but there are several blocks there. Uh, Carrie Burrell, uh did a, an investigation of the land across the street. And here you can see the amount of uh, debris, concrete, and so on. Uh, the only place where the, there was anything preserved at all was sort of at the end of the lot, and that was the late 19th century. But oddly enough, she was in the pit looking at this gasoline, stinking uh, portion of land and found this little chip, which was from a clay pot dated 1810, 1830. So at least we're, we're getting up about the right time period, even if the archaeology of this area is not uh, particularly good. Dan Wagner, who's a local geologist, uh, helped us a great deal with his core. And in fact, I think that the coring approach it's much more useful than either uh, any of these electronic uh, methods. And here you can see Dan pulling up and laying out the core that he's pulling up. Now this is the area of the Park Service land by 20. And around 40 centimeters below the surface, uh, you can see a cultural deposit, wood, uh, coal, uh, iron nails, and so on. So we're kind of zeroing in on the possibility of finding something. This shows this little area again. And this is my baseline, north-south baseline, which is how we started excavating there. Um, talking about who really worked on this site, this is uh, Professor Troy, one of my former colleagues from Sweden, is a professor of Egyptology. <laughs> Um, anyway, here we are at the intersection, and you can see these two by two squares uh, that we started to um, put down on the site. And at 20 centimeters below the surface, we came across these bricks. <coughs> and lo and behold, the bricks turned out to be an alignment, either a wall or a foundation, we didn't know which. There were three bricks wide, three brick, bricks deep. Uh, 40 centimeters below the surface, we found a wood plank floor, cedar plank floor preserved. I could believe it. Um, here you can see the stratigraphy, the uh, humus layer, a lot of rubble fell, and then the wood preserved under that. Well, this changed the orientation of my dig. I went from the north-south to 
follow the little the red brick road approach. <laughs> Um, and here you can see our alignment of little test units following these bricks until we got to a corner. This is the southwest corner of this structure. And you can see how well preserved this is. This actually is a brick foundation wall for one of the Reeves farms. And here you can see the plan. When you go down deeper, we also have the cedar plane corner preserved. So we have the brick corner and the cedar plane flooring. Here we are in the now northwest corner. We're starting to pick up that wall. And this got even more interesting because within this structure, we found a beautiful pattern brick floor this time, not a wooden one, but a hairy bone brick floor. Uh, Dennis Pope came by uh, one day and we were looking at this building, this incredible building that's appearing before our eyes. Uh, on the outside there was a concrete floor, which was apparently a later addition. Uh, here you can see the uh, the brick, the uh, herringbone brick pattern floor, and we expanded that area a little bit and found a drain, apparently a brick drain. Uh, following the wall eastward and the floor, you can see the extent of the uh, brick floor and the wall. And this is what we found on the north um, part of the building. Here is this um, foundation wall. Here is the brick floor. Here is the drain. I put in a, a little test pit here to see what kind of flooring we would have. We found the extension of the brick drain, the herringbone brick floor, and the plank floor. Here you can see that drain, <coughs> and there's the preserve, preserved wood. Um, this is a drawing showing the different parts of the construction. The wooden floor was put in, held in place by floor nails, hand-tuned nails that were 12 centimeters in length. Finally, looking at the southeast corner of this building, we found remnants of the wooden floor. And in fact, the, uh, although the wood was rotted from this area or had been removed, you could still see the impressions of the wooden floor and the floor beams which had been there running at right angles. Uh, the stratigraphy of this site was interesting. The building must have been partially exp uh, exposed in the 1960s because on the brick floor at a depth of 40 centimeters we found a coin from 1960s. So most of the artifacts from this site are the result of later infill of the foundation. And there you can see a lot of objects are found you can tell from the nails that we have uh, a number of cut nails, which are 19th century, and then ungalvanized uh, wire nails, which are into the 20th century. <coughs> so what we have here is a foundation measuring 20 by 40 feet, a brick floor seven feet across, and a cedar plank floor nine feet nine inches across. This was a carriage house or a stable belonging to the Reeves property. The carriages <coughs> would have been stored on the brick floor and the horses, and in the case of that uh, shoe that we found, mules would have been kept on this side. So it's a beautiful 19th century example of 
architecture of that, of that time. Now, what about the spring? Well, Lawson has an illustration of the spring. <coughs> he describes it's a little south of the road, about 200 yards southwest from the mansion of Mr. Reeves. Um, here is um, our dig, and you can see the outline of the carriage house. Looking across the street, there are three houses, and then this open area of uh, ground where the old gas station had been. No one knew about it, but looking at an old source, Washington City and the Capitol, which was a WPA publication with a lot of oral history, lo and behold, there it said, Barney Spring is under the porch of the house at 3041 Bladesburg Road. <laughs> There it is. We just looked up, there's the house. <laughs> so we went over there and the old lady said, get the hell off my property. <laughs> there's no way we can dig there. But I, but I could stand on her front yard, look across at this parcel of land 520, there's a bus stop there. This is Bladesburg Road, and then there's a concrete medium, medium going up the middle. So, so the spring is under the porch. Yes. Mm. Well, sometimes you get really lucky. <laughs> One day there are a couple of guys wandering around with a laser and measuring things. So we asked them, who are you? And they said, well, we're from the D.C. Department of Transportation. What are you doing? Well, we're going to excavate the median because we're going to green DC, we're going to get rid of this concrete and put in soil and green stuff and all that. So Ruth Tricoli and I dove into the trench, followed these guys to see what we could see. And what we found here, you have that little bus stop 520, is the original turnpike level. You see that great? There's now much. There's that much fill, you can really see what that turnpike is made of. And in that turnpike level, red bricks, fragments of bricks. This is the second Reeves barn, the one that is described as being a couple of yards from where barn is stood. And while we were working in the ditch, we noted that water was seeping across from for uh, whatever the address is of the house on Bladesburg Road across the field. Here you can see it. Here you can see the red brick. So to kind of give you a, an overview of what this is all about, these are the two Reeves farms. This one is the carriage house. This one is down under the road. And uh, Barney Springs at 3041 and runs across or ran across today ran, runs under the road. The original turnpike is on the right side the right hand lane facing east. Mm -hmm. So Barney's guns his 18 pounders would have been located just about there and if you look at the a firing position below the crest of the hill, which is right here, you can see that Barney had his guns set up as soon as possible below the crest because according to artillery manuals, you don't want your guns on the top of the hill where you're silhouetted against the uh, sky behind you. You want to be down below the crest. And that is where um, you can see those guns work. Um, so essentially, we have located, I think, fairly accurately where he was, where the turnpike is, and where Barney Spring is located. And I could say that we had so much fun on this day. <laughs> it's not every day you can follow 
a red brick road like this. It's not every day you can have so many people in the neighborhood who didn't believe that there was anybody interested in doing anything in their area. Every, we were there 19 Saturdays, and every time we were there, local people would come out, say, what are you doing? This is great. This is exciting. Now, what I would like there to be, and I'm surprised it didn't happen because this is Park Service land, is that a little bench, a little sign, maybe a cannon, <laughs> could be put on this little preserved parcel of land, a protected area that is in D.C. I'm sorry, in Maryland, it did a wonderful job on the War of 1812 and Blainsburg and all that. But this is actually DC's part of it. Um, so anyway, thank you very much. speaker for this panel is Richard G. Irvin. Mr. Irvin has been with the Maryland State Highway Administration for 25 years where he is a senior archaeologist. And congratulations for your longevity in, in, in your time with SHA. Uh, recently he has been involved in several War of 1812 related archaeological investigations at Bladensburg, Benedict, Coxfield over on the Eastern Shore, and Pig Point where he worked on the likely wreck of Barney's flagship, USS Scorpion. Uh, please welcome Rick Irwin. you about some of the archaeological work that we did at uh, the Bladensburg battlefield, but I'm going to try to focus uh, additionally on some of the historic research that we did and the implications uh, for what we found for the uh, uh, town of Bladensburg, how the battle impacted life in, in and around the town. The battlefield itself is uh, pretty well developed. Uh, by 20th century um, commercial and residential development. Uh, you can see the Reeves House is up here, Port Lincoln Cemetery. This is the uh, mausoleum, the little chapel was built behind that. Uh, an entrance road was, uh, was later constructed. This is uh, uh, the construction around the entrance road. Uh, eight to 12 feet of soil were taken out of some parts of the cemetery. And you have uh, graves throughout the entire area. Um, nonetheless, we took some metal detectors out there. Um, in addition, we also did some work uh, in the District of Columbia. This is not too far from where Noel was working, uh, basically right up the district line from uh, uh, U.S. Reservation 520. And we also did some testing on Maryland National Capital Park and planning land uh, throughout the uh, entire battlefield and did in fact find some uh, intact soil strata in certain areas. We found a handful of artifacts related to the battle, um, five musket balls, one piece of uh, sheet lead that we believe is part of a, a flint wrap uh, probably an unused flint wrap that would have been used to secure the uh, 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 flint within a flint lock musket. The area where we found all of these artifacts were a little bit to the right flank of where Noel was working. Would have been the location of where uh, Samuel Miller's Marines were stationed uh, on Barney's right. So these, uh, and the musket balls, uh, where we could measure and or weigh them all appeared to be British musket balls fired into the American lines. We also found a number of uh, domestic artifacts that could be related to the battle, probably not. 
Uh, some of them might be related to the Civil War fortifications in the area, um, but a lot of them may also be related to a couple hundred years of agricultural use of this area. So we found some uh, buckles, the, uh, um, the spout. The spout may well be uh, related to the Civil War encampment, uh, horseshoe or mule shoe, uh, that could be from any era and a part of a hurricane lamp, again, probably from the agricultural activities on the property. So, uh, during the work, we also did a lot of uh, background research, and I'm going to try to talk about what kind of impact the battle would have had on the people in Bladensburg and the surrounding area. So, uh, the British landed at Benedict, and camped there on the night of August 19th. They didn't arrive at Bladensburg until noon on the 24th. So that's several days where the British were marching. Everybody knew where they were coming, except for the uh, American generals and politicians. Um, and you can imagine the impact that this would have had on the people in Bladensburg. Now the reason that the uh, British were, were coming was uh, uh, they had been in the Chesapeake in 1813 and 14, they were raiding and pillaging, uh, burning plantations and towns in retaliation for uh, the first American invasion of Canada uh, in which the Americans uh, burned Fort York, Toronto. So, um, here's a quote by Rosalie Steer Calvert uh, in a letter to her sister. Uh, you can imagine the, the feelings of the people in Bladensburg as they're waiting for the British over this several day period marching towards the town. Number of people uh, uh, left the area, uh, particularly Washington, D.C., which was largely evacuated. Uh, the little gal there doesn't look terribly concerned, but she would have been back in 1814. The battle itself involved thousands of troops on each side, although not all troops were engaged at the same time. Uh, still, you had massive numbers of American uh, militia forces who were encamped there the night before. Uh, you also had um, uh, troops arriving during the morning of the battle, American troops. In addition, you had uh, about 4,000 British who arrived in the town of Bladensburg about noon. Uh, these numbers of men were going to have had an impact on the landscape. They would have trampled crops. They would have destroyed fences. Uh, there would have been uh, damage to property from uh, shot and, and musket fire. Uh, damage to residences and other kinds of buildings. Now this is a quote from uh, Charles Ball, who was a free African American who fought with Barney uh, in the flotilla. Um, the Merchant Marine and, and American Navy were uh, uh, one of the few occupations open to free African Americans at the time. <coughs> Um, unfortunately, Charles Ball does not talk a lot about his experiences during the battle. He basically just mentions that he was there, he said that the militia ran away, and eventually uh, uh, the flotilla men and Marines were forced to retreat. Um, there are accounts that, that Ball actually um, began serving one of the artillery pieces when, when one of the uh, uh, other flotilla men there fell from British fire. This is a picture of the, uh, the Marines and their three 12-pounders. Uh, uh, you can also see that there are people uh, dressed not in Marine uniforms. The flotilla men were in, intermingled among the Marines uh, throughout the battle lines. And uh, we know that the battle did cause property damage. We have a uh, um, House Report number 977. Uh, February 8, 1861, in which John Veach is asking the U.S. Congress for $1,200 for damages caused to his property uh, as in consequence of the occupation of his farm by the American Army on the 24th of August, 1814. We don't know whether uh, Veach ever received any kind of payment from the Congress, but uh, obviously uh, there were damages to his property. 
One of the other uh, tremendous impacts that would have been there after the battle had ended was uh, British casualties. Uh, British wounded who were not too severely wounded went with the rest of the troops as they marched down in D.C. late that afternoon into the evening. However, there were probably about 200 British uh, dead on the field of battle. Half those, uh, those of the higher rank, uh, including officers, were buried by the British before they left that afternoon. Um, Glee notes that uh, many of the men who were fit for duty were, were uh, uh, burying the British dead. However, we also know that uh, about a hundred were not buried at that time. Um, and in fact, were buried by Americans uh, the next day in shallow graves along Bladensburg Road. Most of those burials were done by enslaved African Americans. George Calvert wrote that his father, also George, uh, who owned land within the battlefield, the day after the battle had taken all his field hands to the battleground to bury the dead. There also would have been some damage to uh, the town itself. There were reports of uh, British cannonballs uh, being embedded in the walls of uh, the George Washington House, uh, or actually Ross's Tavern at that time. Um, we don't have any uh, specific evidence of that, but it's not an uncommon occurrence. And this is from uh, uh, a church in Norfolk, Virginia, with a Revolutionary War cannonball uh, in, still embedded in the side. The uh, Ross's Tavern was used as a field hospital. Barney asked the uh, British uh, sailors who eventually carried him on a litter to take him to Ross's Tavern. Uh, the British wounded were also taken there. And uh, by this time, Barney had been paroled. He actually uh, acted um, uh, as being in charge of all the wounded in the hospital, British and American. Uh, the British, on their return to, to uh, Bladensburg the, the next night, did leave a small detachment, uh, as was customary, uh, with their wounded at Ross's Tavern. Uh, once the Americans returned to the battlefield the next day, that detachment surrendered to the Americans uh, along with the uh, British wounded. We also have reports that the David Ross House was used as field hospital and that there may have been um, uh, British burials in the back of that house, which has uh, been moved to another location. And we know that there were uh, residences, residences in the area that were occupied by British troops, at least temporarily, at the close of the battle. But the, by far the greatest impact of the Battle of Bladensburg was psychological impact it had on the American psyche. The, uh, you can only compare the events of, of, of those several days to Pearl Harbor or 9-11. Um, it, it was shocking to the American public. Uh, they expected that the American army would be able to uh, fend off the British. Um, instead, the American militia ran. Uh, only Barney and, his, uh, and the uh, Marines actually stayed to fight the British for more than a few moments. Um, it was shocking to Americans, embarrassing to Americans. Now, this is another quote from uh, Gleig, the British subaltern, who wrote so extensively about his, his experiences. This is what happened when the British returned to the battlefield uh, the following night. They marched into Washington, burned buildings, um, were encamped the, the following night. Uh, a large storm came up. People said it was the biggest hurricane that had ever hit the area. The British quietly left town. Um, overnight marching back towards their ships. Um, this gives an indication of what the battlefield looked like. When we gained the ridge, um, broken arms, caps, cartridge boxes were scattered about in every direction. The dead were still unburied and lay about in every direction completely naked. So it must have been a, a, a horribly devastating scene that would have been witnessed by everybody living in Bladensburg. 
But the consequences were not all uh, negative. A number of British uh, troops were, were left in Bladensburg to recuperate, and uh, some of them, at least one of them, Colonel, uh, Lieutenant Colonel William Wood, formed very close friendships with a lot of the folks in Bladensburg, some of the townspeople, who actually came down to the hospital to care for the British wounded. Uh, he actually visited the U.S. in 1825, returned to Bladensburg, and visited with uh, some of his, his friends, including uh, Christopher uh, or Richard Lambs of Bladensburg. So, what do we have as a legacy of, of this battle? Um, recently, we've uh, celebrated the 200-year anniversary of the battle. Uh, our perspective is very different from what it was in the days immediately following the battle. Now we're looking at the sacrifices that people made rather than uh, the, the, the shock of what happened when the American militia turned and ran. Joanna Blake's going to be speaking later today about the monument that is now open in Bladensburg. This was the uh, dedication ceremony and uh, um, members of the U.S. military, U.S. Marines, Marine Corps Band. It was a very beautiful ceremony. In addition, the uh, Battle Bladensburg Visitor Center on Maryland National Capital Park and Planning land uh, now gives a location where people can, uh, can go and, and learn about the battlefield. These are some of the uh, folks who work with Maryland State Highways over the last four or five years uh, while we we're doing this research. Uh, thanks to the Park Service for their funding and thanks to everybody else for uh, for being uh, wonderful colleagues and working with us. It's a, it's a really complex story. The federal government took over all of that property south of the D.C. line for Fort Lincoln. Uh, after the end of the Civil War, they uh, returned portions of the property to the beaches. Uh, some of the outlying um, uh, batteries were on beach property, but the fortification itself was um, um, what became the National Training School for Boys. So the federal government maintained its ownership of that property for uh, about a century. The uh, National Training School uh, changed its name. Basically, it was a, a reform school, later a prison, um, and it was closed, I believe, in the 1970s. Once that facility closed, the uh, federal government started trying to find other uses for the land and worked with the uh, district government uh, for some of the development that's now occurred in there, both commercial and residential development. Uh, Reservation 520 and this other parcel on the other side where the gas station was, I guess were the last pieces of land owned by the federal government, and by that time they had been transferred to the Park Service, at least 520 was. Um, I think the feeling was that that one small parcel on the other side of the road just didn't have a lot of value in and of itself, and so um, it's part of the same overall development that's going on. Uh, Richard, Mike Arnold uh, from Prince George's Heritage. Uh, just a comment on that. It's, it's my understanding when we were engaged with Ruth and, and company uh, at the beginning of the task force process, that that property, while it's privately held, is actually held, uh, that, uh, that corner is supposed to be developed as a park. Uh, and we had preliminary conversations about considering the, the archaeological resources and at least some sort of a memorial park on that site. And, and actually the developers were very receptive to that, but as we know, the development of the battlefield trajectory took a different path, and since it was across the line, we never pursued that. But I think that's still fertile ground and, and a, a distinct possibility in terms of creating a memorial you know, where Barney was. Thanks. You know, the lower area of 520 uh, is really a beautiful, protected little parcel. It, the only one in that whole area. And it would be very easy to, to put some sort of, a, a, like I said, a bench or a cannon or at least an information plaque in there. We're just very lucky. I, I even think the Park Service sort of forgot that they even had it. Although somebody is still cutting the grass there, it's a nice area. There's a 
shade tree and it was a great place to work but it, it's just a very lucky thing that it's still there. Lots of questions in the back. Yeah, that property at uh, 3941 Bladensburg Road, is that uh, privately held now? or? Yeah, there's an old lady there, a cranky old lady. <laughs> okay, cranky old lady. And, and I'm not, you know, it would have been kind of fun to dig under her porch, but she, you know, truth be told, told she was terrified that we were going to move her, that we were going to disrupt somehow sure. everything. Um, at some point, we will probably get access to it, but I'm not really sure that it would really tell us anything more. We know, actually, there's an area uh, of about where all three of those houses, where the water sort of seeps, it's very wet, and the spring probably comes up in several places. But what is amazing, although you can't see the water today, that it is still seeping down under the road and across 520. And if you look at 520, you can see where the water has eroded a little uh, uh, furrow down, down that lot. So uh, we'll see what happens. Maybe, you know, she'll pass away <laughs> and we'll get access to it. But I was just amazed that no one seemed to have noticed that reference in the 1937 publication. It's the only one there is about the actual location of the, of the spring. Chuck Day with the Amon Trust. Uh, uh, I've always wondered, Joshua Barney supposedly was from Baltimore. He was a revolutionary hero. After the Battle of Bladensburg and it recuperated, he went west to claim some land, and when he got to Pittsburgh, his wound reopened, became infected, and he died. Supposedly, he's interred in Pittsburgh. Has there ever been any consideration to having him return to Maryland, which is his home? I, I have heard no talk about that possibility. I, I have. <laughs> I, I have relatives in Pittsburgh and recently they put a very nice bronze plaque on the grave of Barney and uh, I corresponded with them since I was associated with the monument in Bladensburg about Barney and uh, I don't think they want to they want to sort of claim Barney as their own and I've corresponded back and forth with uh, one of the reporters that wrote a very nice story and they really feel that uh, they want to hang on to Barney's bones but uh, it is something to explore. Yeah, I think we should consider asking our government to, to strongly request the return of his bones to his native state. I, I couldn't hear it. <laughs> Request that the governor ask for Barney's oh, return. Well, I, I don't think so. Well, who knows? Uh, it may be possible. Timothy Mulligan, just a, a quick question that may be jumping the gun for later, but is there a plan to publish the findings that we're hearing here today and earlier presentations in, in a way that uh, Maryland residents and Prince George's County residents in particular can take advantage of? Mike Lucas and Julie Shablitsky, uh, Mike with Maryland National, Julie, or formerly of Maryland National, Julie with uh, Maryland State Highways, have just published a book on the archaeology of the War of 1812, which you guys can find online. Sorry, I, I did not bring any of the uh, information. Noel and I jointly published a paper, and you and Mike uh, co-authored a, a paper on your work at Nottingham, in addition to uh, many other chapters. There's about, what, 18, 20 chapters in, in, in the book? I, I can also add that you probably noticed that we are videoing the, this um, symposium and um, uh, the video will be made public uh, probably through the University of Maryland Library's website 
it's likely just to be like on YouTube, you know, so it would be easy to get to. But certainly there are a lot of people who could not be with us today and um, expressed an interest in, in getting a chance to uh, see these presentations. So uh, they will live on. Um, I have a dig report from the excavation, uh, which is available if someone, I only have one with me here, but if you want write me, I could get copies of it to you. What, ha what happened to all the uh, graves and bodies that were along Bladensburg Road? Were they moved to Fort Lincoln? We don't know. Um, we do have accounts that uh, within a, several weeks after the battle, uh, U.S. Congressman uh, named Ingersoll visited the battlefield and reported that he could still see the shallow graves of the British soldiers along Bladensburg Road. Um, we also have reports from 1819, I believe, uh, from a traveler who uh, went through Bladensburg who indicated that you could see some of the uh, uh, bones eroding out of the, the roadside. Uh, we just don't know whether they are under the sidewalk, under uh, some of the paving, um, it's unclear. Uh, state highways will certainly be uh, uh, cognizant of that if we do any kind of work uh, alongside the uh, Bladensburg Road uh, in, in front of the areas where the British casualties happened. Um, could, could you just comment on the American casualties? Very few. <laughs> the, the American militia suffered only, I think, two or three casualties. Um, Barney's men, uh, the, the flotilla men and marines, suffered uh, a number of dead and wounded. I'm trying to remember um, some, something like that. Yeah, there were 114 marines and uh, just about 400 flotilla men. Uh, about 500 naval and U.S. Marine troops, um, and there were at, at least 30 casualties. Uh, uh, some some of them uh, 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 severe wounds, some some dead. You go, Freddie. Uh, could I go ahead and ask him? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I wanted to know a little bit more about the African Americans that were part of the flotilla. You mentioned that they were the only service where they could serve, but could you tell us a little bit more about that and Charles Ball? Right, Charles Ball was uh, uh, born an enslaved person um, down south in, in Calvert County. I was, I was thinking it was one of the southern states. Anyway, he escaped. He uh, uh, lived the rest of his life as a free man, wrote an autobiography that was publish published in 1839, I believe, and uh, basically gave an account of his life. Um, for whatever reason, the Merchant Marine uh, was open to African Americans, and it always had been. It was a very, very difficult occupation. Uh, people were on board ships for months at a time. Um, you had to be tough to be um, a sailor or uh, in the U.S. Navy, British Navy. Um, uh, but for whatever reason, African Americans were uh, welcomed into those kinds of uh, services. They, they had always uh, uh, made up a, a certain percentage of, uh, of the crews of, of merchant vessels. Um, I've seen estimates that a very high percentage of the uh, Chesapeake flotilla was made up of uh, free African American men. That's interesting. The, um, apparently, um President Madison, uh, President Madison was uh, visit, visited the troops on the battlefield, and he asked Barney if the African Americans, and there were a number, would run under fire. Barney answered, "Yes, 
No, sir. They don't know how to run. They will die by their guns first, which is the only quote I've seen where Barney's saying, these guys are here to fight. And in fact, a lot of the Navy, uh, a lot of the merchant Navy had African-American sailors. They were extremely uh, competent men and actually uh, could receive quite a lot of pay and rank in the, in the uh, merchant marine as, as um, at that time. Thank you. So, so, so my question is about Nottingham as a tourist. Uh, I'm surprised to find that there's any park in Nottingham at all. My impression is of a lot of uh, private property, no trespassing signs. Um, so is there a plan to develop that park so that it's attractive to people like me? Well, a lot of the park land, is, a lot of the park land is under agricultural lease. There's 51 acres of park land there, and the majority of it is under agricultural lease. Uh, it's mixed in with private properties. Um, so we have, you know, parkland and then a private property and then some parkland surrounding it. So it's very difficult. Um, we are going to be doing, hopefully be doing more archaeology in the future. We have erected some interpretive signage. We plan to do more. We have the Nottingham Schoolhouse, which has been restored and has an exhibit on it. And we plan to do public programming there. But you, you run into a problem when you have parkland. That's also a residential neighborhood. And we do have to be careful about encroaching on people's lives when we develop parks. A nice thing would be a, a right-of-way down to the river. You can't even see the river when you go to visit. Uh, well, because there are houses between me and the river. Do you, you see it? I try driving down the road to the river and, you know, private property, don't come down here, don't turn around. You know, if they want to do the back, I turn around. Well, we can only control the park, man. Okay, I think this has been a very uh, interesting and successful panel. Uh, let's give a round of applause to our presenters. <laughs>